please join me in welcoming Jan Kregel back to UMKC. Changes a little bit every time. So. <laughs> I can't say I have heard it before. No, tra traditionally, after, when you go someplace, you always say, "Oh, I'm very glad to be back here." Uh, and in fact, I'm going to say that, but more or less, I do mean it. I really enjoyed the time that, uh, that I spent here teaching, and I do like to come back. As I, Kansas City is a, a great place, and I think this is a great program. So I am, in fact, very pleased to be here. So I'm pleased to see old friends I've worked with you know, before. What we're going to do today, or what I'm going to try to do today, is something that's, that's really simple and comes from a, a number of things which I've been doing recently, which start out in, well, have started out in terms of development and development finance, but eventually I've discovered that I'm probably a little bit larger uh, import. And the, sort of the best way to explain it is that you know, the sort of things that you always thought were great, in fact, probably are not so great. Or moms and apple pies are maybe not really good for you. Something like that, okay? Uh, and I'll give you a simple example to start with before I go into the, the presentation here, which is another one that I normally use. Bretton Woods, okay? We love Bretton Woods. It's great. Because when it disappeared, we thought things got pretty not great. And if you look at Bretton Woods, you say, what did it do? Okay, well, stable exchange rates. And exchange rates were stable. Wasn't good as the Keynes plan, but it was good. Generally, now, pick somebody. Yeah, I like Bretton Woods. This was, this was great. We'll go back. And you then think of it a little bit from the point of view of a developing country, from the point of view of developing strategy. That's how I started on this. And virtually all the post-war development strategy says that we should be having transfers of financial resources from developed to developing countries. The UN has got its 0 0.7 target since, since 1964. Still there in every UN document. Okay, we actually believe that we finance development by moving money from developed countries to developing countries. Okay, you think about this for a minute, and you think of your balance of payments accounts. Say, okay, developing countries are getting these foreign transfers, foreign incomes. It has an impact on the capital account. We know the capital account has to balance the current account. So it means that basically developing countries are going to have a current account over a reasonably long period of time in which what happens? Well, if you're going to have more imports than you got exports, you're going to end up with a capital current account deficit. And that current account deficit has got to be financed somehow or other. Okay? And then you look at Bretton Woods and you say, well, Bretton Woods did what? Bretton Woods created a stable exchange rate system. And how do we get stable exchange rates? Well, we know basically that stable exchange rates require that your current account is more or less in balance. Because if your current account goes out of balance, what happens? Well, you've either got to borrow or you've got to go to the IMF and the IMF is going to come into you and say, look, you've got to shut down this game, guys, because you're going too fast. Now, if you're a developing country and you've got a development strategy that says I've got to borrow a whole lot of money over time in order to develop and I'm part of the IMF, it says that, wait a minute, your development depends on what you have in terms of your reserve balances. And if your reserve balances are not large and they're not going to be large because you're running deficits all the time, which means that you're going to be using them all the time in order to stabilize the exchange rate, then it means that on balance you're going to be going to the IMF a whole lot. And the IMF is going to be telling you, look, Bretton Woods, slow down, don't grow so fast, don't develop. So basically, if you look at the Bretton Woods system, maybe it was great for people who 
you know, traded with each other and wanted to avoid beggar my neighbor monetary uh, exchange rate policies. But for developing countries, not so good. And if you were a developing country that believed in theories which were very popular in the 50s and the 60s, which talked about exchange rate management, dual exchange rates, multiple exchange rates, exchange rates that manage to develop your manufacturing sector, IMF was a total disaster for you. Okay? So this is the, the sort of thing that, that you work on. That is, you say, okay, things that I thought were really good, maybe were really good for some people, but maybe they're not that good for other people. And what I'm going to do today is to take on not Bretton Woods and stable exchange rates, I'm just going to take on financial stability in general. And I'm going to argue that financial stability is a bad thing. Okay? Now, say, in general, we spend all of our time trying to think up ways to make the financial system stable. What I'm going to argue beyond that is not only is it a bad thing, it's something that helps us explain why we have substantial income inequality in capitalist systems. I'm going to argue it is basically because we try to stabilize financial markets. This is what provides that income inequality. So, let's see if I can figure out how to make this thing advance. So, we start out, we have to say, well, where does income and wealth equality come from? We go back to standard John Maynard Keynes. Outstanding faults of the economic society in which we live are its failure to provide for full employment and its arbitrary and inequitable distribution of wealth and incomes. Okay, everybody knows this. Everybody quotes it. Okay? Keynes solved one of those problems. Okay, which one was it? The employment problem. At least he thought he would solve the employment problem. Hadn't yet heard of Donald Trump. Thinks he solved the problem. But if you look at the way he analyzed the system, what I'm going to argue is that he traced both of these faults in the system, that is the failure to provide unemployment and the inequitable distribution of income, to the behavior of the financial system. And in particular, to what? Generically, we call liquidity preference. Okay? The wealth holders' irrational demand for liquidity in the face of uncertainty about the value of their investments. Okay? When the guys who got money don't want to lend you the money to make a steel plant, what do they do? They put it under the bed. Well, they don't quite put it under the bed. They put it into the bank or they put it into treasury bills or something like that. But they don't finance investment and they don't produce employment from those, from those investments. The system fails. How does it fail? The financial system fails because, now we all know the quotation about the green cheese, okay? When people want green cheese, when they want liquidity, when they want something that has zero risk, the financial system usually fails to give it to them. We don't give them enough green cheese in order to make them happy. As Keynes argues, if we gave them enough green cheese, then they'd realize that, well, that risk really was not a real risk. And if they, in fact, went out and did finance investment, that those investments would create incomes and create profits and create the liquidity that would satisfy their fear of losing all their money. So basically, the key to both faults, we said, can be found in the fear of loss on assets, the fear of default on loans. It's just people being certain about their funds, okay? And this is what? Well, this is basically, if we divide the system into creditors and debtors, it's basically the creditors that we're talking about here. It's the creditors that cause all of these problems. So what did Keynes say? Shoot them all. Euthanasia of the rentier. Okay? That's how we get rid of this problem. And of course, an active role of government in providing the liquidity that we need to keep the system going. Now, as I said, all of this I originally developed, uh, originally worked out uh, as it applied to developing countries. And you know, as the 
confession. This was originally a, uh, a keynote I gave to the uh, National Association of Economists in Brazil in November or something like that last year. So what I'm going to do is to very quickly skip the development part of it because we really don't need that. And go straight to the regular proposition. Okay? And that is to go to this idea of the provision of the liquidity, the provision of the financing that we need for the investment. Whether it's developing countries or developed countries doesn't make that much difference. Okay? If we look at this provision, okay, we can say that probably the biggest problem that we have in terms of creating this excess demand for liquidity is in terms of the instability that's caused by the financial system itself. So that the ability of the system or the ability of Keynes' system to provide a remedy to employment depends on more or less the stability of that financial system. Okay. Now, this is basically Minsky's argument, which says that, okay, fine, you may be able to get yourself to a great moderation, that what our friend Bernanke called it. We could get the system to a point in which, in real terms, it looks like it's growing just fine, but underneath, the financing conditions are creating the potential for fragility. Okay? So, on the one hand, we can say, okay, we've got all these policies that are going to get us to full employment, that are going to get us to grow, but underneath all of that financing, that provision of liquidity, which we know that we can create, it still has the possibility of coming back to bite us. Okay? And Minsky says that it's always going to do that. that it's in fact, you cannot, uh, you cannot escape. So that whether you're a developing country or a developed country, you always have, in this case now I call it the domestic finance constraint. The domestic finance constraint is what? Well, it's really not the ability to provide the financing. Okay? We know that we can always do that. Okay? Schumpeter told us that. L. Albert Hahn told us that. Ben Dixon told us that. Matt remembers that you were right, it was Alice. Mm -hmm. uh, a whole series of German business cycle theorists explained to us that, look guys, yeah, as long as you've got a financial system, you can always get the liquidity, you can always solve your problem. Okay? That's not the difficult thing. The difficult thing is what? The difficult thing is that, okay, you can do it, but it might create problems for you. It's not the solution that it appears to be. Just because you can create as much finance as you need, it's going to create a problem. And the problem is not going to be the standard Milton Friedman problem of inflation. It's going to be the financial instability, the financial crash, the financial breakdown. So if we look at what I call this financial constraint, I link it to what Heiminski called the necessity of having two masters to regulate your financial system in order to allow it to provide for employment and this more equitable distribution of income. First, the need to provide a safe and secure means of payment. This is what we'll call the first master. Second, the need to finance inherently risky investments in new development projects to expand employment, some of which will inevitably fail. Okay? This is what we want the system to do. Okay? If you believe in any sort of theory of technological change, all of these theorists will tell you, what do you do? You bet on every horse in the race. Because you have no idea which horse is going to win. You have no idea which technology is going to be the best technology. So you invest in every one. Okay? And this, I think, one of the rare cases in which theory is more or less confirmed by reality. If you look at most of these Silicon Valley investors, what do they do? 
they give a little money here and a little money there and a little money everywhere. So they, because they have no idea which ones are going to make it. But they're pretty sure that one of them is going to make it. So the little losses that they make on the ones that don't, they are more than compensated. Now, the first master, we said, is represented by the bank deposit liabilities used as a means of payment which are created by bank acceptance of claims on the returns to the risky investments of entrepreneurs. Okay, what does that statement mean? It means that if we have a bank and we know that the banks create liquidity and they use that liquidity in order to finance risky investments, it also means that in order to be able to do that, the liabilities that they create have to be used as means of payment. Okay? So, basically what we've got is a bank's balance sheet in which you've got one master on one side and another master on the other side. And the constraint or the conundrum that we've got is that somehow or other, and this is something that preoccupied Minsky most of his life, was how to make those two things match. Okay? Because if we look at the liability side, the liability side says what? It says that this is master one. This is the means of payment. The safe and secure means of payment can never fail. On the asset side, this is the financing to these crazy guys in Silicon Valley that are thinking up new kinds of stuff every day, which in the beginning looks pretty silly, but eventually, some of them eventually you know, even work. I used to watch the dating game on television. Did you ever do that? I think this is Zuckerman. What's his name? Zucker, the Facebook guy? He also watched the dating game. All he did was say, oh, I've got a computer. I can do the dating game on the computer. And then all of a sudden, we've got Facebook. Who would have thought that the dating game on television would have produced Facebook? Okay? But that's what you've got on the asset side of the bank's balance sheet. That's master two. And what are we saying? We're saying for every Mark Zuckerberg, what the hell is his name? Zuckerberg? Right. Yeah, that's it. Zuckerberg. Okay. For every one of these guys, you've got 500 that fail. It means he would say that's a good thing because without those 500, you wouldn't have gotten the one that worked, even if you think the one that worked is pretty stupid. <laughs> okay. But the problem is the banks are sitting there with all of these 500 or 499 assets that are supporting those liabilities does not compute, okay? Master one and master two simply cannot, cannot match. They can't be satisfied all at the same time. So what we've got here is a question of looking at how we respond to this problem. How do we respond? We respond by looking at uh, what we call prudential regulation, for a better word. But basically what you're trying to do is to say, somehow or other, I've got to make this balance sheet match. I've got to make it balance without having anybody take a loss. Okay? Now, how do you do that? Well, there are all sorts of ways to do that. You could put limitations on the asset side or the liability side of the balance sheet. Okay? The asset side restrictions are what? Well, we used to back in the old days, we used to tell banks what they could, what they could do, what they could lend to. Okay? Say, real estate? No, can't do that. Too risky. Not a good idea. You're going to get into trouble. Very famous old English lord from 16th, 17th century. What is the difference? Okay, or no. It goes like this. How, how, do, you, how do you know if you're a banker? Banker, you know the difference between a mortgage and a trade bill. Finance any trade bill you want. Why? Because there's stuff there, okay? And the stuff self-liquidates. That way you're a banker. You don't get into trouble. If you don't know the difference between that and a mortgage, you're not going to be a banker very long. Deposit insurance this is another form to guarantee the value of bank liabilities. This is the objective of what? This is master one. Master one, we give insurance. Or we require banks to hold equity, or to have equity, not to hold equity. They don't hold it, they have it. 
to absorb losses. That's a master two problem. Okay? Or finally, we get a central bank. And the central bank comes in and either through some sort of moral suasion or through its discount window, attempts to exercise control over master one. Okay? You open up a banking textbook that was written in the 1920s, okay, which is the period in which people were figuring out how the Federal Reserve was supposed to work, you always had a big chapter on eligibility. Okay? Eligibility. What did eligibility mean? It meant what you can take to the Fed to discount and what you can't take to the Fed to discount. And quite obviously, if you can't take it to the Fed to discount it and nobody in the market wants it, it's not worth anything. So, very strong incentive to the banks to have certain types of assets in their loan book that they can take to the Fed in order to get discounted. Eligibility now has disappeared. We don't worry about that. And eventually we had 13.3, which said basically it doesn't make much difference what sort of paper that you bring to the, that you bring to the Fed. And that sort of got rid of that type of, of regulation. But the real question that we're looking at here is a question of who, in fact, bears the losses. Okay? We have all of these regulations that we attempt to, to introduce. But in the end, it's always going to be the case that somebody is going to be on the hook for these losses. Okay? Now, if you look at most of these Prudential regulations, the prudential regulations are what? They're meant to prevent what we call idiosyncratic losses. Okay? Minsky was always very clear on this when he talked about deposit insurance. But deposit insurance works the same way that health insurance is supposed to work. Everybody here has insurance, but we know that everybody's not going to get sick at the same time. Same thing with bank insurance. It works if only one bank gets sick at the same time, which means that the banks have to have a particular kind of sickness. And that particular kind of sickness is basically the guys running the bank cheat. They have fraudulent activities. Okay? Those are the things that we can handle. But if it turns out to be a systemic problem, which we discovered, or Mary Eccles discovered when he was running his bank in Utah, okay, that if everybody is perfectly healthy, but everybody dies, then you've got a problem that your insurance really can't deal with. Okay? So Eccles was there looking at his farmers in Utah. He says, gosh, you know, they're all good, upstanding people. They're all there. They're ready to, you know, they're going to pay back their loans. Except that all of a sudden, we don't know why. It's not because they didn't run their farms correctly. Last year they were fine. This year they got no money. Okay? That's a systemic crisis. And the problem is that our prudential regulations normally okay, can't deal with that sort of that sort of difficulty. The problem is that eventually. We have to do something. We have to do something which is what? Well, we have to do something because if we look at master one or we look at the liability side of the balance sheet, we realize pretty quickly that if master one fails, then the entire system fails. Okay? Our prudential regulation is not good enough to prevent master one failure. Then the entire system goes down. So what's our standard response? Well, the standard response is Anne Rand Acolyte, Alan Greenspan, saying that every time I saw a possibility that Master One would fail and there would be the possibility of a collapse in the value of the liabilities of the financial system, I was there. to support the system, okay? And this is great, 
Why? Because he's supporting my means of payment. He's supporting my deposits in the bank. And I think this is a really good thing. Okay? The problem is that if he's supporting my really good things on the liability side, he's also supporting those things on the asset side. So implicitly, again, balance sheets have to balance. You have master one and you have master two. You have the assets and the liabilities. We always intervene to provide stability in the system by intervening in order to protect the liabilities of the banking system. But implicitly, we're also doing what? We're also supporting not only the assets of the banking system, we're supporting the liabilities of all those people who borrowed money from the bank, all of those creditors. Okay? Now remember, our entire problem started out because we said it was the creditors who created the difficulties. Okay? So that we end up with this paradox, which says that the creditors are the ones who create the difficulties because they have this excessive liquidity preference. But at the same time, okay, these are the ones that we give preferential treatment. Okay? We always bail them out, effectively. Okay? And this is really not a question of simply saying, well, it should be the bank shareholders that bear. No, this is the entire credit side of the system. Okay? Now, if you do that, what does it tell you? It says that basically, if you have a position in which the system does go into a systemic crisis, the support is always going to be justified on the grounds of financial stability. We have to intervene in order pre to preserve financial stability. But we intervene to preserve financial stability by doing what? Well, the best example was the one during the Great Depression, Irving Fisher, reflate, get prices back up. Okay? Now, as I said, this is great on the one hand, if you happen to be a creditor, because your assets, which have just gone to zero and are going to push you into bankruptcy, now you say, no, 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 we've got a floor under these. We guarantee that there is a floor under the value of your, of your assets. So that if we do the balance, now not between the creditors and the debtors, but we do the balance between those guys who actually have credits, who issue liabilities, and the people who don't, now who are the people who don't? Well, the people who don't are the people who work. Okay? So that whenever you get a crisis, every crisis produces a position in which there is a socialization of these losses and back to the question, who pays? Well, the creditors don't pay because we're going to intervene and we're going to make sure the value of your assets doesn't decline too badly because if it does, the whole system is going to collapse. So who's going to pay? The guys who don't work anymore, the unemployed. Okay? The adjustment in the system is always that it's labor that is going to pay for the support of those assets and it's going to, in fact, underwrite the financial stability of the system. So if you've got a system that is subject to persistent crises, what is going to happen? Well, persistent crises says yes, you're going to have fluctuations in employment. This is one of the reasons why the people who work for a living don't have assets that get supported. Okay. And they're going to be the ones who, in fact, provide the support that we classify as financial stability. Okay. Now, we can call these bailouts. Yeah, they're bailouts. But the other side of the bailout is what? The other side of the bailout is all those people who are not working. They're the ones who are affected. They're paying. paying. So, basically, what we're doing is protecting the financial system by protecting creditors. That's, that's what financial stability means. Okay? If you've got some wealth, if you've got something you can invest and you manage to get it into the system, 
financial stability says that we're gonna we're gonna give you a leg up on everybody else. Okay? Now Go to the bottom. Note that this reasoning is just the opposite of the position that argues that those who provide the saving for investment will have an increasing share of wealth because they bear the risk and uncertainty of investment in new development activities. Implicitly, what we're doing is we're saying, no. We're giving you a form of insurance, OK? in terms of financial stability. Now, what have I done? I've simply said the same thing as Keynes would have said in terms of providing liquidity. Okay? Sounds much better to say providing liquidity, doesn't it? Okay? You like that. It's like you like providing financial stability. Okay? But if you're a worker and you earn your living by wages, it doesn't sound so great anymore because it says basically when we do that, you're the one that is effectively going to pay in terms of your foregone income. And your foregone income means that probably you're not going to be accumulating a great deal of assets so that you can't play in this game. Okay? So financial stability is a game which, say, under a capitalist system is rigged. It's rigged in order to ensure that the guys that got the money keep the money because this is how we justify it, because we need them in order to make the investments that provide the employment this other stuff. Now, I'm not making a statement one way or the other whether you think this is a good thing or a bad thing. It's just that it makes sense to understand that this is how the system works. And as we said, why, remember Keynes says that the faults of the system, well, this is why these are the faults of the system. And this is why he didn't manage, in fact, to resolve, to resolve those problems. Now, if we look at the alternatives, what are the alternatives? Well, there seem to be two alternatives. One, provide the same guarantee to labor as you provide to wealth holders, to investment. Okay? You have Minsky's employee of last resort. You can think of this as a, a labor bank. Okay? And the <coughs> labor bank does what? Well, you can say the labor bank has a labor stability problem. And what we want to do is to intervene in order to create labor stability. Okay, we've got financial stability over here for the predator guys. Well, why don't we have employment stability over here for the worker guys? Okay, makes sense, or does it? Probably it doesn't, because the system would work a little bit differently. But the idea is that if we do it on the one side, we should do it on the other. If we've got Master one, we've got master two. We've got assets, you've got liabilities, and why in the world do we only support one side of it? So, like you say, this would provide minimum stability to labor incomes in the same way stability to banks' assets and liabilities are provided by prudential regulation and crisis intervention. Indeed, it is widely accepted that the best remedy for poverty and income inequality is, in fact, a high level of employment. Because if you do have a high level of employment and you do have stable incomes over time, in fact, do, people do manage to accumulate something which allows them to get some of the tokens that you get to put into the system in which we give a support. Very interesting. Minsky, at, at one stage, when he was talking about reform of the financial system, made a proposal which everybody thought was completely nuts. This is one of the things which sent me down this line. He said, well, instead of having deposit insurance, why don't we put insurance on investments? So the banks invest and they have insurance on those investments. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be better? Wouldn't that be more sensible? And, you know, when you present this, people look at you and say, are you nuts? It's fine to do deposit insurance because that's the payment system. That's, those are my deposits. I'm happy to have support for my deposits. But if you go to the other side and you say, well, implicitly we're already providing a certain degree of insurance to investments, why don't we just do it that way? We just you know, say, okay, you invest in a steel plant, you, know, you get an insurance policy, you get to write off 20% of, of the thing if it, happen, if it happens to go bad. 
The other full government guarantee, okay, Minsky also proposed that you could replace the insurance funds for bank liabilities for full guarantees. And as I've already mentioned, this idea of providing insurance. The other development banks or national banks can solve this problem quite simply by simply setting up a development bank, have the development bank run the risks and the losses so that in fact all of the potential risks and losses are borne by the entire collective. You don't have the problem that it's just the creditors. As I said, this is a more radical alternative, but one which governments always discover in the process of financing a major war. Okay? Every war that has ever been financed, you always find governments not bothering to go to the banking system and say, look, you have to do this, you have to do that. No, we can do it ourselves. Okay? Even the British government in World War I bypassed the Bank of England. They said, look, we're not going to bother with this business of creating government debts and having to finance those government debts and creating little pieces of money that we're going to spend for so We're just going to do it, period. And they did. Okay? In terms of the US Second World War, very famous proposal by uh, US Congressman Wright Patman. He said, look, you know, we're fighting this war, and we're paying for the war, and basically we're borrowing money from the banks that we create. And then we're paying the bank's interest for that money. Does not make sense. Really what we should do is just print the money and pay the soldiers. Well, he didn't get very far with that, because obviously the bankers didn't lot. But if you think back to the old Civil War days, greenbacks were precisely that. The government said, okay, we got to fight this war, and what we're going to do is we're going to do it ourselves. And just let these banks go hang. Now, we say, unfortunately, all of these things are basic, have basically been forgotten, and what we continue to do is to run a system in which we believe that we have to provide financial stability. But really what we're doing is providing, number one, stability for a very strange method of financing the system. And this is a met method of financing which implicitly, and this is now my bottom line, if you want to know why you have income inequality, okay, if you've got one set of guys that have variable incomes and the other set of guys that have got a floor under their incomes, probably there is going to be a big difference in terms of their ability to accumulate wealth over time. If you prevent losses over time, then by definition, these things are going to grow. Now, I understand there's a, a French guy who thinks that income inequality comes from the fact that capital always manages to earn more than something else. No, that's not it. Okay, it's the fact that if you're in the system and if you're investing and you're holding financial assets, your financial assets have got a floor under them. And you're more or less guaranteed not to lose. And if you're guaranteed not to lose, by definition, you're going to grow faster than anybody else in the system. And this is where that income inequality, in fact, comes from. And as I said, this is not a question of should the shareholders of the bank okay, have skin in the game? Should they lose their money? Okay? Because it's not the shareholders of the bank who are the ones who are there with the assets in the bank. Okay? This is not the issue. The issue is that anybody who is holding a financial asset is automatically, in terms of financial stability, implicitly getting a floor under the value. So, what happened in the last financial crisis? Basic difference, very simple difference that nobody seemed to understand. What did we do? We bailed out the creditors. And we let the households go hang. Okay? Not only this time did we create unemployment, but we also created increased indebtedness which fortunately we allowed some people to walk away from their houses, which minimized partially the necessity of having to repay that debt. Okay? But 
Now, if you're asking the question, which, which financial assets got supported, okay? Which real assets didn't get supported? The ones that the working class owned substantially, the greatest proportion of wealth in the United States is in what? Your house. Okay. That's what we didn't do. That's what we didn't support. There was no financial stability question about housing. Okay? So, basically, like I said, this is an idea to try and you know, sort of peel back some of these things that we implicitly think are good, are good ideas say, well, maybe they're not that good, and maybe there are other ways that we can do exactly the same thing and get exactly, uh, get exactly the same results. Okay? Thank you.